Good morning, it is just before 7 a.m. and Eric and I are taking off on a trip to our other cabin. It's New Year's Day and we figured we'd go celebrate the occasion up there. Oh my gosh, that's perfect. I would just put some towels or something on over by his antlers. It's perfect. Okay, chickens are all set. All right, boys, check out your new pad. Can you get all the way up there? Apparently. Okay. Coffee, coffee, more coffee. Let's hit the road. Ready? Ready. Load it down. arrived and it is lovely out this direction. There was nine moose on our trip in, one coyote and four car wrecks or so. And I think we're gonna have to do some snow blowing. In fact, I'm sure we're gonna have to do some snow blowing before we can get into the cabin. Right. Definitely gonna need the shovel. It's like completely. It stopped immediately. Yes. What do you got to replace? Where's the rock? Right there. There's a huge rock. Right there. Oh no. That's what, it stopped it immediately. Well, look, it's, it's actually like jammed. locked it up. That's what I thought happened. It like all of a sudden stopped. There it goes. That was it right there. There's a lot of snow out here. There's pros and cons to having an extremely long driveway. This is one of the cons. So we're doing it with the snow blower and we're about halfway to the cabin. Broke a shear pin or a shear bolt. We're gonna replace it. We're gonna start a fire I think when we get there and then come back and we'll get the dogs. But it's like 3.30 or four in the afternoon. It's already getting dark here. That's the broken Where'd one. Where'd the rock go that you? I tossed it way over there, so it's not oh. gonna bother us anymore. What's the temperature now? Look at that, it's already, I heated it up nine degrees already. It's 10, yeah, it's 10 or 11, that's pretty good. Look at Bo. Okay. He's on his rock hard bag because it's so cold. All right, we officially made it back. It took 
forever this time, just over two hours to plow the driveway. I don't know how it took that long. It was actually pretty funny because it just seemed to go on and on and on. But we are excited about the new year. We are excited about moving some of our stuff. We have some stuff in the back that we brought. And we also have a bunch of our food that we need to get inside because it is zero degrees and we don't want it to freeze. I'm gonna get the truck unloaded and Eric I think is gonna do a little more snow blowing because there's more snow blowing to do. Pen. Oh shoot, wind just now on the rock. Oh yeah, first pole in zero degrees. We got the house plugged into the generator, so we now have lights and I got two three important paths done. I got a path to where the generator is, I got a path to the woodshed, and most importantly, I got a path to the outhouse. We're heading inside for the night. Oh, what is in here? Is that what you were drinking? Doesn't get much better than this. Got a cup of hot apple cider and a ripping wood stove after a long drive and about four hours of snow blowing. And it was zero, a uh, little above zero. I think it was like one degrees inside the cabin when we got here. And I think it's been heating up for about four hours and we are now at 60 degrees, which is just extremely comfortable. And I think we'll probably get it up to about 75 or 80 tonight, get it real toasty in here. and. Hit the sack. All right, easy peasy tonight. We are having some recooked homemade lasagna and I think we're gonna relax the rest of the night. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. We got this cabin nice and toasty today. It is almost 80 degrees in here. And when we got here yesterday, it started at one degrees. So it's heated up 79 degrees and we got our hot water going. We're gonna get started on breakfast, but I need my coffee. Okay, well, I'm still in a trance from yesterday. I woke up a little bit late today. It is magnificent here. Every time we come, we pretty much are like, we don't want to go home, but the cat's at home and the chickens are at home, so we do have to go back. Eric's gonna whip us up some blueberry pancakes and we're melting our butter. I think it's almost there. I've pre-made some of our mix. We have flour, baking powder, salt, and cinnamon here. This is about two cups, so apparently we're making a lot of pancakes today. We have three eggs in here for different recipes we're making. I only need one, but they're scrambled eggs now. So I'm just gonna pour a little bit of that in there. There we go. And then I'm gonna show you guys my secret ingredient for making pancakes, kind of when you don't have milk uh, as a liquid. We're just gonna use water, but I've been using this. I'm almost done with my bag. And this is buttermilk powder. And then I tried it one time in pancakes and biscuits and this, it just elevates pancakes. It's really good, so I'm gonna put I'll put a bunch in there. There we go. The one time I was in the elevator, and then what was the other time? I don't know. The one time I elevated off the ground? Was that it? Levitated? Oh, <laughs> I levitated. I'm using Ariel's trick. Anytime you add blueberries to like a 
baked good or like pancakes or something, you put them in frozen and it doesn't turn your dough as purple or that bluish color. So uh, we're ready to go. Let's cook up some pancakes on the wood stove. Big fluffy ones. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Mm. I'll leave it here. Top you on, little devil do you? Mm. That's an extra. Wow. That buttermilk powder is so good. You get really big pancakes. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna do a mix of spruce tip syrup and maple syrup. Practice makes perfect. Practice what? Bulk them up? Like bulk them? Like, 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 like flex them? Like, like make them stronger? Okay. You ready? Let's do it. <sighs> Eric and I thought it would be pretty fun to test out three different types of wood while we are up at this cabin. So right next to me, we have a 2010 Blaze King Royal Guardian, and we have only been using this stove for our trips up here. So we haven't actually been using it very long. Our other stove at our main cabin is a 1988 first stove, and we have used that one a lot. We are very familiar with it. We have been there for four winters actually this is our fifth winter so we're very familiar with that stove it's a big old hunk it works very well it cooks us out of our cabin routinely unfortunately we can't really turn it down that low i don't know why that is exactly but we even have like a little damper in the stove pipe and even with both those methods we just can't turn it down and manage it quite that well we noticed with this stove it's actually night and day you can totally push the damper in and you can get a really increased burn time from it. And this is a non-catalytic stove, but it does, it's just super efficient, we feel like, and we've noticed the difference with how it burns almost immediately. So the test that we're gonna be doing is to test the three different types of wood and see how long they burn, kind of compare them in that manner. And we're going to be using birch, which we all know is an awesome wood, at least for us up in Alaska, to burn. We also have the other, the other wood is actually just spruce, but we have two different kinds of spruce and they're pretty different, we've noticed. One is when they are cut down as a live tree and then they go through the drying process and then you burn them that way. The other is something we're even more familiar with, which is called beetle kale spruce. Fortunately, a lot of Alaska suffered some beetle damage or pretty major beetle damage on these trees years ago. I think it's still kind of happening. And the area we're at, those are the trees that we're burning. So they are standing dead trees. So when we get to them, they're already dead. They've been dead for a few years and the whole decomposition process has kind of started. So those are the three types of woods we're gonna be testing. I'm pretty excited for it. And we have a nice log on there right now and I know it's gonna burn for a few hours. So we're gonna get dressed and head outside for a little bit. In the spirit of testing out wood in the wood stove, why not test out some ways to cut firewood? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna test out three different ways to cut some kindling. Oh, as soon as I get rid of the snow. We've got a few different things out here in the woodshed that we brought up with us, and that is gonna be my Fisker's hatchet. I use this thing almost every single day. We have the kindling cracker, which you use with a big hammer. I don't know how much this one weighs, but this is the one I use with the kindling cracker. And lastly, the one I'm most skeptical of is gonna be something we've never used. I don't know what it's called, but it goes on the end of the drill and you use this bad boy to split your kindling. Let's get started testing these things out. We're gonna go with the Fisker's hatchet first. Well, I gotta say this is my favorite way to cut kindling and we cut kindling a lot and if you're good with the hatchet and you know how to use it you can get a lot of kindling really fast this is a 14 inch 
Fisker's Hatchet. This is my favorite one to use, and it's extremely good at taking small pieces of wood like this and turn them even smaller pieces of wood. So let's get started and we'll cut some with the hatchet. There you have it. That's the hatchet, chopping up one small round into some nice little kindling. Cutting wood with a hatchet, it does require a lot of energy. So if you're young and you want to go at it, you want to smash some wood, the hatchet is awesome. But when you start having a problem with the hatchet is when you run into stuff like this. You can see this is kind of a twisted piece of wood and that is where a branch used to be. So the bigger the knot, the harder it is to get through. And with a hatchet, it's kind of hard to get through knots. So I'll show you what I mean. So something like that, I kind of just leave it into a bigger chunk. When you have a nice straight piece of wood, I mean, kind of like that, just no knots, nice straight grain, they just like fly apart. So it's super easy to cut. And that's that. Let's move on to the kindling cracker. We're gonna have a lot of kindling, man. Crackers ripping today, huh? Well, I gotta say I've never actually done like cutting with the hatchet and then switching over and going to the kindling cracker. But I don't know if you could tell but from the video, the kindling cracker was a lot easier. And this thing actually is meant, you can see it has a couple holes on the bottom right there. So you can bolt this thing down like some, uh, some screws, you can screw it in. But I've found every once in a while, logs will actually get stuck in this thing and you'll have to turn it upside down. You'll have to beat them out. So I don't screw it down to anything. And our wood at home is a lot bigger. Our firebox is huge. So we cut our wood into big pieces. The wood out here, uh, this is the wood that came with the cabin. It's been seasoned for a long time. It's all cut into smaller pieces. It's smaller diameter. The trees up here are a little smaller and it fits in that wood so better. And this kindling cracker is just blazing through this stuff. When I first started using the kindling cracker, uh, maybe like two years ago, I wasn't that big of a fan of it and it just kind of sat there. And then I started using it on wood that was really hard to split with the hatchet that had like lots of knots in it. And that's where this thing really shined for me and I was using it for quite a while. So this is a piece of wood that is kind of twisted. I don't know if you can see that, but it's like completely like just twerked and twisted. And there's a bunch of knots in here. And let's see how the kindling cracker does on this piece. So that's that. Like I said, you just use a big hammer and the kindling cracker. And it's a pretty simple design. It's got like a little blade there in the center. And I'm sure you could sharpen that thing if you ever needed to. Ours seems to be in extremely good condition so far. 
Let's move on to the third and final test. Tried to pick out a couple really nice pieces of wood, nice straight ones. This one has one little knot right there. This one's, I'd say that's a prime piece right there for cutting kindling. And we're gonna use this little drill bit kindling splitter, I'm gonna call it. I don't know the actual name, but it just comes on like a little bit right there. There's different size bits for different size drills. This is the small one. It's the one that fit on this drill. We're just gonna use my rigid drill. This thing's probably like five or six years old. We have a fresh battery in there that was being kept warm inside the house. I looked at videos of this thing online. There was mixed reviews. Some people almost took their arm off and some people were there blazing through the wood making kindling. So we're gonna try it on a full piece right here. Most people I saw do it, they were using like half pieces and they were kind of chipping them off, but let's see. Holy cow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I actually was not expecting that. I was expecting this thing to grip and like spin that piece of wood around and knock me. That was pretty cool. Let's, let's keep going on this. I don't know if you go from the, let's try in the middle. Okay. Oh, that was, that's, that's what I was looking for. Let's get this out of there. Try from this side at the top. Well, I don't know. I think there's pros and cons with this thing. The pros are it keeps your kindling like all right here. So you're not like hitting it and then having to pick up a piece and then hitting it, having to pick it up again. It kept it kind of in a nice little neat pile. And I mean, it did do a pretty decent job and it didn't take a lot of work. And I think what I would do is kind of cut it into smaller pieces, maybe like a little bigger than this with the kindling cracker or the hatchet. And then you could just take this and just get it real small. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, this thing actually does cut some small little pieces of killing. Actually pretty impressed with this thing. That went pretty well. I'm gonna say that I actually like all three methods. I think the drill method, it's kind of a cool way of just doing it and it doesn't take that much energy, but I would recommend starting with like smaller pieces of wood. It might even be better to use a drill that had a plug, you know, that you could plug into a wall, something with a handle that had a little more power, but this one did work pretty good and it got, it got probably the nicest, smallest kindling for me, which was cool. The kindling cracker, this thing's pretty cool. It's good for someone who maybe didn't have a lot of strength and energy. And I mean, it's it's good for wood. That's really hard to get through with the hatchet. And then the hatchet, honestly, still my favorite way to do it just because I like to use a hatchet. It does take a lot of work, a lot of energy, especially if you're splitting a lot of kindling like we just did but we definitely need some kindling in the house. It's always nice to have kindling here the next time you come up, that way you can quickly just start a fire. So we're gonna get this all stacked up, brought inside, and we'll check how our fire's doing and see if it's ready to start our firewood burn time test.
grab this the stuff from here. Oh gosh, that was heavy. I'm going to scrub the stuff from here that I want to use on the day. Well, I think it's about time to start this test. That's what we're gonna start each test with. There's just like a bed of coals in there. The wood stove's on high right now. That'll definitely ignite a fire, no problem. Currently, it is about 74 degrees Fahrenheit inside the cabin, and it is zero degrees Fahrenheit outside of the cabin. This wood stove, the intake on it is not like an outside air intake, so it's just using air from inside the cabin to burn this firewood. So the first wood we're gonna use is white spruce. And this is the wood we've been burning for five winters up here in Alaska. I'd say this is like 95% what we are burning most of the time. And these trees we take down a lot because they're dead. Beetles have infested these trees and they're just standing there. There's no green on them, they're dead. The wind usually blows them down, but the ones we like to take for firewood are the ones that are standing. Usually if they fall down, they start soaking up a lot of water and they're not as good to burn. But this wood is ready to burn as soon as you cut it down. So you don't have to season it. There's plenty of it. I mean, those are a couple of the pros of using this wood. I mean, it's just available. But this wood is extremely lightweight. Um, there's there's just not a lot of mass, I guess, to it. And there's definitely no moisture in it compared to like a piece like this, which was out here. And this is wood that is also white spruce, but this was cut down alive and then it was stacked in a woodshed and it was seasoned. And I'm guessing some of this wood out there, I mean, it could have been out there for like five to 10 years. I don't really know, but it's definitely dry. But the crazy part is this piece right here weighs about the same as this piece right here. And there's a huge difference. And then when you go to birch, this stuff is the heaviest and the densest of all. This has been seasoning for like at least a year. So in Alaska, in our area, birch, this is the best you can get. So let's get this thing going. What we're gonna do for each time we start one of these fires, we're gonna have the damper fully open. So full bore, we're gonna use five pieces of kindling like this, and this is the wood we just cut, so this is the seasoned white spruce. I'm gonna lay them along the bottom. We're gonna try to use pieces of wood that are about the same size, but this firebox is small, so we're gonna kind of puzzle in as much firewood as we can, and we'll leave it on high until it starts to take off, and then we're gonna put it all the way on low, and I guess we'll start our time as, as soon as I shut this door. So let's get this thing loaded up. Okay, one, two, three, pretty good. Well, that worked pretty good. I was able to fit four nice size pieces and that thing is stuffed full. So this is the beetle killed white spruce. It is exactly 1 PM. We got it on a full bore right now. As soon as this takes off, I'm gonna turn it on low. We'll see how long this stuff burns. So while the fire's going inside, we figured we would walk around the property and collect our trail cameras. Hope for the best. We never really catch anything. Uh, we put out trail cameras a lot, but I feel like nine out of 10 times something fails, whether it's weather or just something. So we'll miss, we'll miss the picture of the animal that came right in front of the camera. We just recently switched over to lithium batteries. I feel like that's gonna help us a lot. This is our first time trying them. They're supposed to be a lot better when it's cold out. I think that that was kind of a problem in a winter and for nighttime photos i think that you need i think you need lithium batteries is there any way i can check on if it's uh still working oh my gosh it has 91 percent so it has 50 photos 91 percent huh. that's amazing eric sets up some of ours and i feel like just a few weeks later they'll uh be dead <laughs> and i think this one's been out here for probably close to six weeks so it still has totally a lot of battery power how many photos does it have so hopefully those are animals. Um, sometimes again, it's just weather, whether it's wind or some snow or like a bird flies in and it misses it. So we'll see. Really in, it's just so fluffy. Oh, oh, it fell off.
So ever since Eric and I have been coming out to this place, we have noticed a very large amount of animal tracks or small, I wanna say like small animal tracks, but some of them are probably bigger animals or predators of concern. Uh, and that definitely is a, something for us to think about because we do wanna have chickens out here. And right now where we're at, we don't really have an issue except for aerial predators. So I think here, I think it may be a different story. Um, there are just tracks all over behind me. We've got snowshoe hares up here and those leave like a, I want to say they're like a V. I don't know how exactly they hop, but they leave a very distinct mark. And I think we have maybe Martin tracks. I'm not quite certain. We have ermine, Martin, and Minx. And Eric and I have seen Minx before and ermine. We have never seen a Martin before. And then there's squirrels. There's a bunch of squirrels running around here. They like to eat the little uh, pine cones or the spruce cones and they leave the little litter down below by the base of the tree. We've also seen coyote, lynx, fox, Fox and coyotes walk a little bit different, so that's usually how you can tell the difference between those. And then lynx have a really distinctive paw print too because they don't step that deep. They don't put that big of an impression. It looks like a little bit of an ice cream cone with their foot. And they also don't have nails, so they won't leave nail marks. But we're no, we're no specialists by any means. It's just fun for us to come out here and look, look at all the different tracks. Maybe? See how they, they hop right here? Is that a cool? This is a track we've kind of been thinking about since yesterday when we arrived. It followed the driveway and then cut off into the woods here. And we don't really know what it is. There are caribou, moose, wolves in this area. The bears are hibernating right now. But these are a little older, but they almost left like a really big trench. So it's obviously a pretty big animal. I don't think we have any clue what that is. I'd say dog or caribou. Some sort of canine, yeah that had to push its body through the snow. Yeah. Maybe a, you know what it could be? Wolverine? Porcupine? An otter. An otter? What? <laughs> I always like to leave one good one. Okay. So this has 141 photos. Let's see what that means, right? Awesome, so these are these are Browning trail cameras. We have all different kinds. We've tried different ones. Stealth cam used to be my favorite, but they started to fail me. So these are Browning ones. So far, so good. Let's go see if we got anything on the chips. Found some more tracks and also some poop of the animal. And we know what these tracks are. Uh, let us know in the comments if you can figure out what this is. And I'll give you one hint. It is not a mammal. Quick update on the fire. It's been about an hour and 35 minutes. This thing is cranking off some heat. It's now like 84 degrees in here. I have the damper turned down as low as it will go, but this wood seems to just be burning extremely hot and you're starting to see that uh, the pile of wood in there is getting smaller. So let's check our trail camera chips real quick. See if we got anything. Let's see. Okay. Let's get, wait, wait, wait. What is that? Who's that creature? Snow. I think we might just have a lot of snow on this trip. Hmm. I don't see anything in that one. Any new tracks? 55. Oh, there we go. Got some action. We got two, two ravens. 2.24 p.m. 
That's the next day. Why did it miss Something this? came through at night and it didn't take a photo of it. Immediately in front of it, too. Oh, nice. Freaking coyote, or yeah. is that a dog? Uh, those are someone's dogs. <laughs> those are your classic domestic dog. Yay, I'm waiting for the trail camera. <laughs> awesome, we caught it's barely someone's dogs. Those look like sled dogs or those something. Those look like little... Okay, we got a little fox. Almost looks like a raccoon, but he has a little black arms. That's a little tiny fox, huh? Oh yeah, look at that. Another fox. fox. Another fox. That's it. So three foxes. Or one fox three times. Cool. Keep those here. Every time we come up here, we're trying to bring some things that we can bring, and since freezes inside this cabin when we leave. Uh, this time we just brought like a bunch of clothes and stuff and I think it's time to make some dinner. Let there be light. We've got salad for dinner tonight. We added some salmon to it and we are also making a tomato-based noodle soup. It's something I used to eat growing up. It's really good. Just take some thin pasta. We have thin spaghetti. We broke it all up into tiny pieces and we're frying it with some onion. And then we are going to be adding a can of our salsa and some chicken broth. But I think traditionally you would add tomato soup and chicken broth and you let it cook and it is a delicious soup. What could be better than grilled cheese with some tomato soup? And I just wanted to note, if you put some oil down before you fry your noodles, you'll get a little bit of a better result. I had just browned them. I forgot to add some oil. So you'll get more, more colorful variety of noodles at the end and they'll be fried and delicious. But we do have some grilled cheese to eat too. Can't think of a better food for tonight. Super comforting food. Almost looks like spaghetti. I know, it did lose some of the broth. You're, a, a, you're a bad cook. A bad cook? <laughs> that is it. We're calling it quits for the beetle kill spruce. It went for four hours and 20 minutes. So not that long. That definitely wouldn't get you through the night. You'd have to wake up and put more wood on the fire. I was guessing five hours. Errol, I think, was guessing about that too. So... It's about what it expected. I don't really know if it burned much longer in this stove compared to our stove back home, but you can't fit as much wood in here. So when we first started this test, there was a bed of coals. That's where this one is. There's still gonna be enough in there to leave us a bed of coals. Let's get it moved around there a little bit and spread out. Onto our spruce that is not dead or wasn't dead. So this wood, was cut down alive and it was properly seasoned. I mentioned before it's heavier. It is, these are in nice little rounds. Let's pick a few. We're gonna do five pieces of kindling again. We're gonna stuff this thing full. Okay. The kindling.
Well, I just pulled the damper out, so this thing is getting as much air as it can. I already just saw it take off. And the last one, we left it on high for maybe 10 minutes, and we're gonna do the same for this. Get it a chance to kind of catch on fire, then we'll shut it down on low. I fit five pieces in this one. These pieces were a lot shorter though, so I was able to fit one on the edge, but I think that's pretty comparable. It's basically just like stuffed full and I can't fit any more in there. Let's let this thing go. I'm having hopes that this goes a little bit longer than the beetle kale, even though it's the, the same type of tree. And it's getting, it's getting a little later in the day, so I think this one is gonna take us into the night. That's it, we got her down on low. And I forgot to mention this one, we started it at 5.20 p.m. And this one, and along with one we did before, we never opened the door. So the door's gonna stay shut until this thing is completely burned out. I don't remember the other one having that flame. This is called, it's called like a double burner or a double oxygen something. And it double burns. It's got those little oxygen tubes up top. Shoots little flames out of them. It's a really nice stove. We are melting snow water to utilize for dishes. And I think we're going to probably head to bed now, but the fire is still going. It has been the same time that the other fire died down. So it's still going. I don't know if it's gonna last as long as we thought. I think we agreed maybe about six hours or so. So we'll see, we don't, we don't exactly know. I know Eric will probably have to wake up and check and see what's going on. This one's probably gonna have to fit up top, you know what I mean? I would do those two little ones. The second wood test of the seasoned spruce went pretty well last night. We started at 5.20 p.m. and it went down to embers at 11.20 p.m. So that's six hours. That's an hour and 40 minutes longer than the beetle kill spruce. To me, that's a lot. I mean, an hour and 40 minutes every time you load up this thing is a lot of time on a wood stove. I was pretty impressed with that. I kind of knew that was gonna happen. The beetle kill wood is really starting to deteriorate. There's just like not a lot of mass to it or something. But we threw on some wood last night to make it through the night and it's about 10.30 in the morning, right around there. And we have some kindling going. We're just trying to get a nice bed of coals for our final test, which is gonna be the birch. And birch is as good as it gets up here in our area of Alaska. And sometimes when you get birch, you can get some rotten pieces in the middle. This isn't, this is all really good hard birch. Like this is the biggest one. I'm gonna to try to fit this one on there for sure. And this is a heavy log. You can just, you just tell the difference. You just know that this is gonna burn longer and hotter. So let's give this a couple minutes. We'll put on our five pieces of kindling and we'll see how much we can fit in this little wood stove. Right on the railing. There we go. That's small right there. That was a little bit of a challenge, but we got it packed full in there. It's 10:25 a.m. That's where we're gonna start our time. And you can tell that this immediately just took off. Birch bark. I, I guess there's like oils in it or something, but it's like an extremely good fire starter. You can peel off a tree and it immediately just lights up. So this isn't gonna take long, and we'll kick it down on low and I got high hopes for the birch. I definitely think we're gonna go over the six hour marks with this load. All right, it is already the time to plug the generator back in. Eric and I spent the day just scouting around, looking for some ice fishing spots. We're hoping to do that next time we come out here. And it is two weeks past the winter solstice, but the sun, it just comes up and it seems to like hover around the trees and it just goes right back down. So it really doesn't seem like there's a lot of uh, daylight around this time of the year. And it is frigid out here. I think it's like negative 15 or something like that. So we are heading in for the day, but I've got to get us plugged in.
Well, that's it. We're going to call it quits on the firewood test. The birch has burned down to just embers. And unfortunately, our generator just died and there's oil leaking out of it. So we got to further investigate that tomorrow. But tonight we're going to be running off flashlights and lanterns. It is 6.05 p.m. That means the birch went the longest by far. It went for seven hours and 40 minutes, which is an hour and 40 minutes longer than the spruce and three hours and 20 minutes longer than the beetle killed spruce. So pretty impressive. Errol and I already knew in a perfect world if we could burn all birch, that's what we would do, but that's just not what is mostly available to us. And one thing I wanted to note is today has been the coldest day. So it's been negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit outside all day. And inside here, this birch has kept it between 80 and 70. It's down to 70 right now because these coals are kind of burning out. But we're gonna get this thing fired back up. I've got birch, I've got spruce. And we're gonna be running off a firelight and Ariel is fixing dinner for us. Well, I was in the middle of making this lovely dough when we lost our power and I think we both just were not really quite set up for that. We were really anticipating to lose, to lose light. So it's gonna be a little tricky to make these and we're making like savory rolls, kind of like a cinnamon roll, but they're going to be pesto and marinara filled. And then we're gonna have like butter and cheese on top. So they're gonna be awesome. I think I usually roll standing up. Basil. Go ahead and add some for the top too if you want, or you can just put it all in. Well, here's the plan. And I don't know if it's gonna work. My original plan is to use the Dutch oven and use the lid and uh, cook it on the wood stove with some coals on top of the lid. But I've only done this outside when I started thinking about it. So I don't know if those coals are gonna put off too much smoke and the oven in this cabin won't work unless you have electricity. Since our generator died, we don't. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try it. I've got some canning jar lids down and that's gonna keep the Dutch oven a little higher up so it doesn't get as hot on the bottom. Take our lid, and I use this one upside down like that. That way the coals can kind of sit in there. Not too bad. Gosh, this thing is hot. Oh yeah, that's really hot. Okay, awesome. let's let it cook. Get in there. Poke oh. them real quick with your finger. Are they done? Uh, I'm not looking at yeah, but they're getting close. They're getting close. I need. I think I need. We need more heat in there. That's why I turned the fire up. They're getting there. They look really good. Oh, they need more time. It's still soft. Yeah, they look good. The bottom's not burnt at all either. It takes a really long time to cook it that way. Just like a pizza. Mm-hmm. That's true. Good morning. We're starting the dogs off right today. So this is Bandit's breakfast. Ground beef, rice, some mixed vegetables. Arrow made like a ton of these in Tupperwares. So we freeze them, we thaw them out. He gets half of one in the morning, half of one in the evening. That'll be for him. We're gonna add some hot water. He likes it warm. And then this one is the start of Bo's meal. And this is freeze dried food. I think it's a chicken flavor. 
Uh, it's by a company called Honest Kitchen. The dogs love this stuff. Let this sit for a little while and it'll be ready for breakfast. We're getting started on dinner early. I'm a little fretful since we won't have all of the light um, inside the cabin today. I have some soaked beans. These are white beans from Rancho Gordo and I'm super excited to make them for dinner. So we're dumping them in the cast iron Dutch oven and I have some chicken broth and we're gonna be adding some water to them, get those cooking. And I soak them for over 24 hours so they're pretty well absorbed. Can you tell people about your uh, gas station tip? Usually when you go to gas stations, they don't have anything good. <laughs> but I was at the gas station on the way here and I found this really cool beanie hat with a built-in headlamp. Three settings, pretty stoked on it. I charged it in the truck on the way here. It's got a little uh, USB port, so you can charge it with a USB and you can take it out of the beanie and wash it or whatever and it fits kind of tight right now so I got to break it in but pretty sweet. I have the Alaskan tourist outfit. <laughs> Come here, dude. Okay, Matt, kind of right now. What's your problem? What's he doing? I'm not supposed to for a while. Are you scared of this thing? Guys. Can you check the temperature? <clears throat> no. Negative well, four or five, I think. This is not negative? Yeah. This is negatives? Yeah. I think this is frozen right here, so the problem is. So, pretty disappointing, actually. The Furman generator, I don't know how long we've had this. I'm pretty bad with gauging time, but I'd probably say like eight months. And this thing has been one of the most reliable, best running in all conditions generator we've ever had. And it's also one of the cheapest ones we've ever had. The good thing about these Furmans, at least where we buy it from, is Costco. So if you buy a generator from somewhere else, you've had it for eight months, you can't return it when something goes wrong with it. You have to go through like the warranty. These you can just return to Costco and you can pick up a new one. But it was doing great. It was running in negative 15. And it looks like what happened is the, I think this is the crate case uh, vent tube. It gets moisture in there from being so cold and then it freezes solid in there. So no air can actually vent through there and it blew the oil out somewhere. I don't know what this is on the back. It's not the, the exhaust is right here, the intake's right here and then there's an opening right here. I don't know what that is, but it looks like that's where the oil's coming out of. On our other generator, when this happened, it actually blew like a seal, but you could see the seal. So you could just push it back in. I don't see a seal on this one. So I think what I'm gonna do is bring it inside, thaw that out, add some oil to it. And we'll see if we can fire her up and see what happens. Look at everything's like this is so solid. I can't even get the, any of the clips off. I'm gonna have to bring it. In. We're on a daily walk with the dogs. We like to take them down the driveway, and it is like pulling teeth with them. The older they get, they do not want to go outside. It's warm today, but. They're just not having it, and so Bennett will walk to the end and then he'll race home. Uh, but it's good exercise. Gray hairs, baby. What? Oh, they're white. Never mind. This is frosted. Frosted flakes. So last night we were sitting in the cabin just talking, trying to plan things out for this spring when we come up here and we we're thinking specifically about the chickens. You know, we really want to bring the chickens with us, but what are we gonna do? We're not gonna have time to build like the coop that we want to build. It's gonna to take too much time and it's low down on the priority list. So we're trying to think of ways that we could bring them up here and keep them safe. We know there's gonna be a lot of predators 
And then it dawned on me that we have this nice shed that we have not planned out any use for. So I think what we're gonna do is come springtime, we're gonna turn this shed into a temporary chicken coop and put like an outdoor run on it maybe. So we're just gonna shovel it off and we're gonna go inside and see what we're working with. If they, have to, if they have to hang out here all winter. This is at least 16 feet long. Wonder how old that is. All right, I got some oil for the generator. Let's head out. So I thought it would be fun to put birch bark to the test. Eric and I don't actually use it that much as kindling just because we don't really burn birch very much. Um, so I was doing a little reading on it and I had read that because of its texture, you can actually burn it when it's wet. It doesn't like absorb water. So I have a bunch of birch bark that I've let sit out for a few hours and it's frozen, you can tell. And then I have some other stuff that I let sit in the snow. So I'm testing it in the elements. We're gonna see if it's gonna work. So it's sufficiently wet and frozen. I'm just gonna light it up. I mean, I'd say that's better than cardboard. If cardboard was wet and frozen, it wouldn't burn. That's awesome, look at that. It's actually still wet frozen. So it did go out, but I mean, it didn't go out all the way. That is pretty neat. I would, I would say that actually surprises me. And that passed the test. If you're in the woods and you have some birch around you, you could definitely get a small fire probably started with just um, some birch bark. And you've never seen a birch tree. They look a lot like this. So they have like these layers, multiple layers you can peel off. And it, it does hurt the tree if you pull off too much. So <laughs> I wouldn't do this for fun or anything, but this one's obviously going in the wood stove. The neatest thing to me about birch, for Eric and I, we have to restart fires a lot back home under cabin. And if you have birch like this, it will usually last a good eight hours and you'll have like these really hard coals. And that's just like life changing when you're restarting a fire. Um, the coals are so hard, I guess, the embers and they're clinging to life and you can um, get a fire going real quick. Let's try lighting some of the stuff that hasn't been sitting. Oh look, I'm creating a fire in my own hand. Yeah, it just immediately went, even quicker. So this stuff's room temperature. Oh my gosh. That's impeccable. I mean, that's impeccable. Wow. I'm blown away. Found some oil out in the shed and we're letting things thaw out. The generator's been in here for probably about an hour and the crank case vent tube, which was pure ice earlier and hard, is now soft and I blew the water out of it. This thing has a mechanism on it where it'll shut down if it's low in oil. So it shut down because the oil leaked out of it. We're gonna fill it back up and we'll see if we can, oh yeah, there's a little down there. See if we can have some power later. lost about half of its oil capacity. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the covers back on it and let it sit inside till it's actually dark. We got daylight right now. So a couple more hours, let it really warm up and then we'll give her a try, see what happens. That's a strong one. Okay, so our beans are done cooking or almost done cooking. We're gonna boil up some pasta to have with dinner. And then I am going to add some of our dried mushrooms, zucchini and kale into that bean mixture. Look at all this stuff, isn't it beautiful? This stove has been so awesome for cooking on. I know you probably think you can cook on any 
wood stoves, but that's not always the case. Uh, the one we have back home, it is so big and to get it hot enough to actually cook on comparable to a stove, like a, a cooking stove is like, you have to have a huge rip and roar and fire. So it's only when it's really cold that we can cook on it. Otherwise we can definitely heat stuff up slowly. But this one, we've put water on it. And I mean, it's like one minute and it is boiling. So this, this one puts a lot of heat off and it works really nicely for cooking on. Seems like this trip up here, we're like testing all kinds of things to us and learning a lot. But this is something I found out in the shed, the one we're gonna build into the chicken coop. And this is a propane powered boot dryer. And I've got my gloves here. I got a little wet out there. I'm gonna see if I can dry them. I brought this inside and let it thaw out. I read the little instructions. Takes these little canisters. Well, let's hook it up. This thing's supposed to sit on the ground, so I'm guessing it doesn't get too hot underneath. So we'll see if it's okay on the tabletop here. It says you wanna flip it on its side to start it. You wanna open the nozzle, which is right here. One turn. Okay, so that's a half a turn. Let's see what's going on here. There it goes right here now. Well, I've been tinkering with this thing for like 20 minutes trying to figure it out. And what's happening is if I barely crack open the propane, it's staying lit. So it's barely open right now. As soon as I turn it up, it blows it out for some reason. So if I just have it barely on, it stays lit. Let's see if it'll stay lit if I push it over. Oh yeah. It's really warm. Like really warm. Looks like it's missing a couple pieces that come up and then I go like at like the angle of a boot. But we have an electric one that has them that I could, so I could probably stick that on here. Or I could just use it for gloves, but let me see this. It's definitely putting out some heat. I want to be able to get it hotter though. Yeah, it went out. No, no, it's still on. Gosh. Cooker. Making a cream sauce for Ariel's dish. I don't know exactly what it's called, but it's one that she wanted to make and it's sounding good. So this is heavy cream. And then we already have some herb butter in there, shallot, onion, and garlic. Put this in. Oh yeah. Right, it's time to unite these forces. I added a little flour to the sauce to thicken it up, and then I added our herbs to the pasta. I forgot to put that in. All the onions and garlic. Mmm. Mm. Tastes a lot like fettuccine alfredo. And you know what would go good with this? Is some salmon would be good in here. I think I'm gonna take some of that canned salmon and add it. That's good right there. Right, we're doing dishes with the last little bit of light we have. And Eric and I usually do dishes outside. I don't know why, but we do. Um, I guess it's a messy job. And we tried to do that two days ago at night when it was like negative eight and everything froze really quick. The soap, the water, everything. So we figured we would work smarter, not harder, and be indoors for our dishes. I've never done them this way though. Well, I guess I do them this way all the time at home. <laughs> Look what you did, you little jerk. There's like something slightly like peaceful and romantic about this. It's just like warm water. You know what it reminds me of? A bath. Oh. 
All right, our dishes are done. We are going to relax probably for the rest of the night and just kind of like pack up, clean up for tomorrow. Moment of truth. See if we'll have power tonight. Come on, little Furman. Probably doesn't even need to choke. Well, good news and bad news, guys. The bad news is that the Furman generator only lasted about an hour and then it started spewing out all the oil again. So we got a problem with the generator. The good news is we have Roman candles. Grand finale, folks at the same time. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! <laughs> I don't got anything cool to do with mine now. Here, take one of mine. We've got our coffee all brewed and we're just about ready to hit the road. It's been an awesome trip, a good way to start 2023. We wanted to wish all you guys watching a Happy New Year and here's to many more Alaskan adventures. All right, our trip has come to an end and we're heading out. Eric and I had an awesome trip this time. We wanted to say thank you so much for all of the holiday cards that we got. We love them and we appreciate your kind messages and positiveness towards us as a family. And we hope that 2023 is an awesome year. We appreciate you following along in all the past years. So let's head out. see how cold it is this morning. It says 11 below. Hey. All right. Well, if we're all ready, let's go. Oh. I grew up as a kid, Errol. <laughs> That's how I know these tricks. Go back a little. That's amazing. Happy New Year. Oh, Jesus, I'm still going. <laughs> Man, I didn't do anything that cool. Why'd you do that?